Yeah, and the latecomers have to sit in the front. <laughs> the benefit of being on time is that you get to hide in the back. So come on down if you're coming in. There's lots of seats down here. But actually, it's getting pretty filled up, so welcome, everybody. It's really great to see you all here. We had about a 100 people last night at the first session. And it looks like there's probably about 50 or I don't know what the capacity of this room is. Ben probably does. In this room? A hundred, yeah. <laughs> about a hundred, and we probably have about 75 in here, so that's great. So I'm glad to see you all here. We've also had people throughout the day yesterday and today. So you're here to participate in the uh, American Institute of Architects um, sustainable, sustainable Assessment Team process. Um, Sustainable Design Assessment Team process. So uh, we, the City of Northampton, we applied for a grant from this group in in the summer. I think we applied, and we were awarded this grant, one of five in the country at that time, to to look at issues of sustainability in our community. Um, at, at the time, uh, as I said, we were one of five, and w Pittsfield was another one of the grant grantees. So there were two in Western Massachusetts. Um, I think doing no small part to our advocates in the local chapter of AIA, and I want to thank Erica Gies, who is sitting over here in the corner, for her work on this with us. She's been great to work with. Our process here is to really identify issues around sustainability, around growth, around energy use in the city, and to have identify the issues, identify the conflicts, and identify some thoughts and some solutions as we move forward into building a full comprehensive plan. The city hasn't had a comprehensive plan in over 30 years. We've been developing, certainly, but we haven't had this full public discussion about what that all means in over 30 years. So uh, this is the first step in this formal process. We have been doing planning for many years, and there are many different plans, as you all know. The hope is to pull all of those together, update them, fill in where we need to fill in, and then have a plan that we can refresh and renew every five to 10 years, as opposed to waiting another 30 years to do another plan. Um, but this first process, um, we have lots of folks here from across the country who've been spending a couple days with us here in Northampton. They're going to share some of their impressions with us, and then it's, this is really a time for you to, to share your thoughts and ideas with them. So I'm glad you're here. This is the first step. We'll be coming back together then sometime in the spring to work through some issues, some of the other issues that may grow out of this, and we've been awarded a $50,000 grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do uh, land and housing planning that we'll be working through as well. And we're also in the process of looking for uh, grants for economic development planning. So again, I'm really happy you're here. It's great to see such a crowd. If you're standing in the back, there are seats in the front. That is the penalty for coming late. So feel free to come down. And uh, and, and, feel, and, and please uh, take this opportunity to say what you think. The, oh, one other note is that you have to stand pretty close to the microphones um, because I guess the the public access is going to be broadcasting this, and the sound is being auto-mixed, so we need, you need to stand pretty close for it to pick it up. Okay? Thanks again. <laughs> the most important job I had, and I forgot to do it. Um, Ann Livingston is the staff person from AIA, and she has been at every one of these across the country, and she's been at every day and every meeting here, including the preliminary meeting that when they came, she came out here to meet with us with Peter to talk about what our goals were. So. I want to thank Ann for all the work that she's done on this. I'm going to introduce Ann and she can talk more about the process. Thanks, Ann. Hi, thank you all for coming out on such a great fall evening and getting back indoors. Um, yeah, I should say that I am Ann Livingston. I'm the director of the Center for Communities by Design at the American Institute of Architects. Well, what does that all mean? The American Institute of Architects currently has 76,000 members, architects and allied professionals, so urban planners and um, folks like that as well. The Center for Communities by Design specifically works on issues from the neighborhood to regional scale, including the community scale like Northampton. We don't spend much time on these uh, building site scale at the center. Um, we have in place currently two design assistance programs, one of which has been in place for 40 years and assisted 136 communities, and that is the Regional Urban Design Assistance Team. And that's more of kind of a traditional charrette, something that you all have um, some familiarity with in the community here. We're also now running the Sustainable Design Assessment Teams. That's new this year. 
Uh, you all are among the first five communities to receive the award. And what that includes is the AIA covers the first $20,000 of each of the visits, as well as provides the national team. What exactly do we do on the visit? Well, we don't get this thing to work. <laughs> okay. Each of those programs is based on three principles, the first of which is multidisciplinary expertise. As the team introduces themselves, you'll note that not only are they from around the country, but they all have different specialties that they spend their daily lives working on. The second piece is community participation. We've spent now a day and a half on smaller roundtables with stakeholders and local professionals discussing a wide variety of issues. Um, and we've also had two public meetings, last night in Florence and this evening here. The final piece, and perhaps in many ways the most important, is maintaining a high level of objectivity. All of our team come from across the nation. Nobody is from uh, the Northampton area, or even the Berkshires, or even Massachusetts. They all have very much an outside perspective. But beyond that, all of the national team are here on a volunteer basis. They're giving their time for free to help Northampton become more sustainable. They've <laughs> But wait, there's more. <laughs> we do cover their costs, like airfare and lodging, but beyond not being paid a dime for all of the time they're spending here and all of the expertise they're sharing with Northampton, they also agree to not take any paying work for a period of three years past the end of the project. Okay. Uh, we've already discussed kind of the first bullet here, which is bringing a team of experts from across the nation. The second piece is um, something that's very unique to the SDAP program. The SDAP program was formed specifically to help communities create a roadmap to help guide future design and policy decisions. So while we do come up with some very specific design concepts, in many ways it's much more conceptual. You know, Northampton has asked, how can we become a more sustainable community? And then feed that vision into our comprehensive plan and Peter will talk a bit more about specifically how we define sustainability. But it's, it's very much you know, looking at a, a whole set of aspects regarding Northampton. How can we have an economy that's viable into the future that also creates a strong sense of social equity as well as protecting the environment? Of the first five and then an additional two that we awarded in this year, you can see Northampton and Pittsfield were among the first five. And um, also, amongst there, we have New Orleans, which um, has not been completed yet. So the assistance there has um, shifted somewhat, unfortunately. Oh. And here we go with the terms of art. The charrette, which generally refers to a very um, public process that integrates design elements. The term means the little cart. It's a French term. It comes from the um, Ecole de de Beauvoir, which I'm horrible at French, so I can pronounce. But uh, essentially, when the architecture students had a project to do, they would actually literally put it on a cart and often be working on it as it was you know, hauled down to where they would be critiqued upon it. We don't have a little cart, um, but the elements that are in common here are the design elements and the compressed time frame. We are only here for three days with the full team getting a whole, whole lot of public input, so really hearing from Northampton what your vision for the community is, and helping you to articulate that both verbally as well as visually, and then feed that into the comprehensive plan process. What does that actually look like? Um, this is actually from Cache Valley, Utah, but this is essentially what we've been doing for the past day and a half, is sitting around round tables, hearing what people think about your community, you know, what do you like, what don't you like, what maybe are your goals and vision for your future, and what are the threats or challenges to achieving that. And then, to the extent possible, putting that in a visual format, as well as um, textual or verbally. We then have public meetings last night and tonight that look essentially like this. And again, we go back and we refine the drawings, as you see on the top, but also write up um, bulleted points that are put into a PowerPoint that we'll produce tomorrow evening in another public forum but also in 45 to 60 days, we'll provide a written report. And I would like to now defer to Peter Arsenault, the team leader for the Northampton Estet. Thank you. And I need to publicly thank Ann for all the support we get from staff and uh, AIA National because you know there's a, a whole lot of work that goes on to put these together, as you can imagine. She's done a great job of organizing and coordinating all the logistics, um, as has um, 
your local officials. So we're delighted to be invited here uh, to participate. Um, but there's a lot of work that's gone on by Wayne Fighting, who's the director of planning. I think many of you know Wayne, uh, as well as the mayor's office. I think Terry Anderson is here um, in Economic Development in the back. And uh, we, so we really want to thank the, the support that the, the mayor's office and the, the city administration has given to the whole process. Okay, sustainability. It's a term that's kicked around a lot. Um, we want to be sure that we're all on the same page. We've put up two definitions here. Fundamentally, we're talking about um, what does it mean to have a quality of life, to maintain the good things and positive things about uh, life in Northampton in particular, but life in general that affects this generation, those of us that are living today, as well as future generations. The Iroquois Nation said it best, I think, uh, when they talk about making decisions that affect seven generations. There's also three tests of sustainability, all right? Anything that we look at that we say, okay, well, how sustainable is it? How long will it really last? How much of a big view, um, a big picture view can we really get on this? It's, it's not just environmental, although environmental stewardship, environmental sustainability is very important. We deplete all of our natural resources, either in the, in the city of Northampton or, or, or related to what we need to maintain our quality of life, well, then that's not sustainable. Uh, but it's also economic sustainability. How do we maintain and sustain and improve the economy that we're working in within the city and region? And the third part is social sustainability. How do we make sure that we have um, the right mix, the right ongoing conditions that allow everybody to participate? Now, the, the key here is to say that any decisions or any thoughts or any planning that we do need to be tested against these three principles. So we should assess them and say, all right, have we done something that's really moving all three forward? If we do a great job at coming up with something that's a, uh, a social program, we say, oh, that's perfect, that's exactly what we need, but it relies on depleting environmental resources or it relies on uh, you know, the economy suffering, well, is it sustainable? How long can we keep on doing it if we, if we don't have all three legs balanced in the, uh, the three principles? So that's what we're looking at. Northampton, um, was selected in part because of the, um, uh, the impressive job you've all done with planning principles, with uh, sensitivity to a lot of sustainability issues already. Um, the, uh, the planning process that's being kicked off here with the ESTAT is a, 12, a 6 to 12 month planning process, I'm, uh, I'm told, that will really be an update of the master plan, a new comprehensive plan uh, that there was one done some a long time ago, I don't remember the dates. In the 30s, okay. Um, 30 years ago, excuse me. Okay, um, so it's it's now time to take all the pieces and say, okay, how do, how do all the pieces of planning that have been done, very good work, by the way, um, how do they all fit together? How does it balance? And how do they fit against the, the theme of sustainability? How do we know it's gonna be able to continue for more than just our generation? Um, the issues we were asked to look at, uh, we were invited to, to focus on, started out with three main issues, uh, sustainable land use, economic development, and sustainable energy use. We broke those down into subcategories, so there's really a total of six. What I'd like to do is go through each of the, uh, the six, introduce to you the, uh, the team leaders briefly on each one, um, and then we're gonna turn it over to, to really hear what, what you all think about um, the sustainable points, sustainable um, issues on your mind related to these six topics. The first one is sustainable land use or smart growth principles. We have with us Joe Donald, who's from uh, New Jersey. I think you have all the bios in what's been passed out. The issue that we were asked to, um, to look at is understanding how the built environment and land use patterns really work together. What's, what's really workable and sustainable? And in fact, are there different ways of doing land use planning or zoning that might in fact be more sustainable? Should things like that be looked at? What do we mean by that? This is a picture of a typical single zone land use. What does that mean? I don't know if I have a laser on this. Um, down at the bottom of the, the screen, you see a lot of housing. Just above that, you see some open space. Above that, you see commercial and industrial uses. Okay, each zone has its own use. A lot of people have said, okay, well that's great, as long as you have automobiles. So you can get from one zone to another, so that you can drive to the store, or drive to work, and so forth. But is that the most sustainable model? Are there other models that can be looked at? Joe, do you want to elaborate? Let me pass the mic over to you.
Hey, good evening. In a very simplistic sense, I suppose smart growth is really looking at ways of managing growth within your community. Um, how do you grow in a healthy way that takes a look at maybe transportation options, affordable housing, open space, um, economic development, and bring all those elements together in a very sort of balanced way that there are no sort of winners and losers, but you're looking for a real win-win type situation. So in a most sustainable sense, smart growth tries to sort of emulate some of those things. Now, smart growth can be a lot of things to a lot of people, but in, again, the most simplistic sense, is looking for balance, balance in growth management. Thank you. This is the second that we've done this. We didn't have mics last night, so pardon our clumsiness. The, uh, by the way, we don't normally do two, okay? We don't, we don't usually only do one public session, but uh, at the request of the city, we agreed to do two. Someone said, is this extra credit? I don't know, but we're, <laughs> um, we're, we're happy to do it. Uh, we're also happy to see the, the amount of participation and, and interest. Second area under land use is open space planning. Margarita Hill is with us. She's a professor of landscape architecture, uh, uh, previously at the University of Maryland and now at Cal Poly, at, 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 at San Luis Obispo in California. Um, uh, as a landscape architect and has been looking at these questions. Almost a fifth of Northampton, we're told, currently is in protected uh, open space. Now there's plenty of other open space that isn't officially designated as a park or a trail or, or something, um, but, but already you've got a, a, a notable start on having identified protected open space. Uh, the question is, as Joe was mentioning, what's the right balance? What's the right mix of natural areas such as this one we saw as we were driving around, um, and looking at things like um, the hospital site or this nursing home site that has a campus institution already that has some open space on it, and what's the balance and how does that factor into the, the mix? Margarita? Uh, good evening. We've been hearing a lot over the last couple of days from people who are either new to Northampton or have lived here for a long time. And they tell us uh, stories about how the natural beauty of the place and, and the natural environment is really uh, one of the things that really adds to the quality of life here and makes this place unique. Um, we heard from someone earlier today who talked about the web of life or the web of Northampton. Really the web of Northampton is its open spaces, its parks, its wilderness areas, its farms, um, the water. And so we really want to hear from you tonight about, uh, at least in relation to the open space issues, um, where is that balance between the need for um, you know, to build the economy and, and, and to accommodate growth um, and the need to protect and enhance open spaces, the natural environment, our cultural lands, um, and, and what are some new strategies that maybe we can develop in a more sustainable model that helps achieve that balance. Thanks. The next um, piece of land use, number three, is uh, transportation. Karen Frost is with us from Portland, Oregon. Um, I think many of you know Portland is uh, almost legendary in their um, uh, transportation and transit planning uh, option. They've taken a philosophy of people first, transit second, automobiles third. So it's a, a mind shift as part of that whole sustainable, sustainability long-term view. What's best for who? Are we planning for cars? Are we planning for people? Um, recently, uh, Northampton, um, we've seen the 2005 transportation plan. That's been the, the basis of a lot of the discussion and um, whatnot the last few days. Um, but the, the question is, what's the integrated approach? Are there options already in place or things that need to be looked at? A lot of us are familiar with streets like this, but this is purposely taken as from a pedestrian point of view. You know? Again, we think about streets as a place for automobiles. Do we think about them as places for people, too? Um, this is a, a generic picture that shows at the top housing. Um, of, the type isn't important, but down below you see a school, and here we have a deliberate um, initiative to connect the school to the housing area so that the kids can actually walk or ride their bikes to school and not rely on school buses or, or all of us parents who have to drive our kids to school. Erin? Right. Thank you. 
Um, I'm delighted to be here tonight um, in the company of all these architects and, of course, in your company as well. I am one of those folks who sat out in the audience just like you. I came to uh, be a transportation professional by being an advocate and coming to the meetings and uh, scratching out um, designs on sheets of paper. Uh, frequently in those early meetings, people were complaining about fast-moving traffic, and that was the only thing about where to put a stoplight. That was the only option that people were thinking about or put in a crosswalk because their children couldn't get to school. And the people um, like yourselves and we have met earlier are way beyond that. They understand that alternatives uh, like biking, walking, and transit, and, and encouraging more people to use those alternatives will make our streets safer for everyone and um, address those three issues of sustainability, of course the environmental, um, using up natural resources and oil resources, uh, degradating the environment. The economic is uh, the one way to look at it, and a small, small portion of that is the impact of driving so much on businesses, and a greater and a, and a huge impact is also the health issue that businesses are facing and we personally are facing because we're a sedentary society. Um, businesses are, are really facing a great crisis when it comes to uh, the cost of um, our not moving around much. And of course we have to look at our children and whether they are going to be uh, physically active and being able to get to school and just have the joy of being independent rather than being driven everywhere. Um, the um, Centers for Disease Control and uh, prevention have estimated that the generation of children right now are not going to live as long as their parents. And that's the first time in history we can look around at our transportation system and figure out how to change that. Some surprising facts. Okay, so those were the three subcategories within land use and, and growth. We're going to move now to the second main category or our fourth topical area is economic development in, in general terms. Um, Rick Chapla is with us from Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's the vice president of a company that uh, looks at economic development issues. Um, economic development is seen as critical to Northampton because it's so related to um, quality of life. As the economy goes, you know, so does everything else that, that we do. Um, but like many places in the Northeast, there's the, the major shift has taken place. It's no longer a manufacturing and industrial economy uh, model. It's moved to educational, institutional services and government. Um, and here's a, a prime example um, that many of you are familiar with. Here's a, a mill building that was very successful, operated as a mill. Um, economy changed, times changed. Now there are businesses in here um, as an incubator uh, project that are focused on different things. There are different types of businesses. Are they just as vibrant? Yes. Are they uh, sustainable? Probably. Are they likely to grow? Um, that's the, the question. Can they grow in Northampton? Um, what's interesting is that this building in the uh, mid-1800s, uh, mid to late 1800s when it was built, was the product of a planning process and a different one than we're going through, but nonetheless someone planned and decided we're going to do this. If you take into account the fact that uh, generations are about 20 or 25 years or so, um, the kids that are in school now, kids that go to this school are the seventh generation from the people who started this building. The decisions we make will have tangible efforts. They'll still be around seven generations later. And Rick. Yes. How, how fascinating of an observation that there was planning that went on actually when this building was constructed. Gee, that's great. I, I knew Northampton was really enlightened. I mean, it, it's it's come through very loud and clear. Um, really, as a part of these uh, public uh, input uh, sessions that, that we've had. Um, you know, the, the reality is it is the 21st century. Um, massive changes have taken place on a global scale. Um, economic development. Is, is a global uh, phenomenon. Uh, competition is no longer just within the region, uh, even within the state, even within the country. Um, the flattening of the world, 
um, is very evident and, and is evident here as well. The flattening of the world is continuing. Um, where Northampton chooses to go for its future um, is what this is all about. Um, it, it is about choice um, and, and it's why it's so fundamentally important um, that these sessions take place because you are impacting and influencing policies, programs, practices um, for the next 30 to 50 years guided by a theme of sustainability that are going to transform and keep this community intact for hopefully at least another 100 years. I, I challenge, I guess, to you uh, this evening um, just to think about strategies and actions uh, for carrying forth the health and vitality of this wonderful community. Um, for the little ones like this that are, that are standing up here in the front row. Um, that's, 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 he is standing. I know he's pretty small, but um, that, that's, what, that's what we're doing. Um, and on behalf of two of the rest of the group, I, I really am deeply appreciative uh, to, to the commitment that you all are showing of, of really um, charging ahead to define your destiny from an economic standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Related to economic development is um, the question of housing affordability. Um, uh, Sandra Mallory is with us from Seattle, Washington. Um, a lot of people who come from the West Coast think anything on the East Coast is affordable. Um, but that's um, less, that's less of the, no, it's not true, I know. Um, I said a lot of people, not all people. Um, there, there is a question of um, what is the right level? How is, uh, how is, um, how affordable is the housing in, in this area? Some have said it's very affordable, some have said it's, it's totally becoming unaffordable. Um, and it's not just affordable housing projects, if you will, it's affordability for everybody. You know, can a person who works in Northampton afford to live in Northampton? Um, and if they can do that today, can, will they be able to do it 10, 20, 30, or 50 years from now? Will other generations be able to do that? Um, it's an attractive place. You've attracted a lot of people um, because of it, and a lot of the, the normal pressures that are going on have produced new subdivisions, uh, like the one uh, that's pictured here, which on the surface seems to be very doing very good things. And, uh, it, and it, in fact, I think it is. Um, there are walking trails, there's some sensitivity to the environment, there's some open spaces preserved. Um, the question is, can, will everybody be able to afford this if the price keeps going up and up? Sandra? Hi. Um, and I think what we're talking about in affordability here is both affordability for um, people who are teachers, people who are, oh, say, architects, um, or... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'd like the opportunity to move here someday. Um, or, you know, people who also are working in the kitchens for the restaurants that are bringing in all of the tourists. So there's a, one of the, there's a couple key issues that seem to have come up during the last couple days that we've been here. And one, actually it was last evening, a woman mentioned that there's not a very efficient use of space here. And that if we're going to create housing that's affordable to everybody, we need to use space more efficiently. And we also need to create a much greater range of housing types than you currently have. And so you've got the you know, low income projects on one end and then you've got higher end single family homes and you need sort of everything in between. And some of that is going to require uh, new housing, some of it is gonna require rehab. And some of the big questions for you are where is that actually gonna go? And how is it going to connect to services? If we take a look at this picture behind me, you know, are those people able to access jobs and services easily so maybe they don't need a car so that their life is more affordable and not just their house? And so then, and the other piece um, would be just looking at sustainability, energy efficiency, looking at any new housing development as a model for how to develop from here on out. And so I'd be really interested to hear from all of you what your ideas are in terms of what needs to happen and what can happen. Thanks, and that's a perfect segue into 
our sixth topic, which is sustainability of um, energy use. Uh, Dennis Andreco is, is with us. He's a, a professor at the University of Buffalo, but he's uh, a practicing architect as well with uh, uh, well over 20, maybe more than 25 years of experience in energy related work. Um, the question that we've uh, been asked to look at is, you know, how to improve some of the good things that are already happening. Um, Northampton has signed on to uh, uh, the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, um, uh, ICLE, program that says, regardless of what a federal or a state government might do as a municipal locality, uh, that you guys can choose to do certain things to reduce global warming and greenhouse gases. Um, and we've observed a, a truly um, a sincere eagerness on the part of a lot of people, public and private and, and um, lots of different sectors, to really do something that's uh, more sustainable and non-polluting. And I guess I would describe that as if you look on the right at the, the current reality of uh, buildings and cars and um, even municipal use like streetlights and so forth, that are going on now in terms of energy use and a potential vision of a clean, uh, this was done by a child uh, in a UN poster contest, of a vision of what, what could a sustainable energy use for a sustainable city look like, you know, how do we bridge the gap? How do we find out how to get from where we are to where we'd like to be? Dennis? Thank you, Peter. Good evening, everyone. Strategizing, we've been spending uh, quite a bit of time in a very energetic way, that's a term I've been using in my sessions over the last uh, couple of days, to look at some of the constraints maybe that exist here in the community and turning those constraints into challenges, looking at some of the obstacles uh, that perhaps exist here and turning those obstacles into opportunities. But fundamentally, some of the overriding aspects relative to energy is looking uh, at saving energy and using energy wisely. How do we do that? How could we do that? How should we do that? What is appropriate for this particular location in this particular region? Uh, but not just the region, but look individually, look locally, look at a community level, look also at some of the ways that we relate to as has been discussed briefly in some of the earlier comments uh, on our relationship to this flat condition or the global condition uh, and how we interface with that. Conservation is probably one of our most precious resources and that's one of the things that surfaced, I think, uh, from the very beginning and is paramount for any of us to uh, give some additional thought to. Uh, and also the education of the information about the saving of energy and using energy wisely. We've also invested some time in exploring various aspects of alternative or renewable energy. Uh, so that we have some diversification of our options uh, for the near term, for tomorrow. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but it's probably somewhat real that one could easily posit or predict that uh, within a few short years we could have double the energy requirements uh, of dollars for our fuel types uh, because of our reliance on the fuels that we use now. So, uh, alternate, alternate energy and um, uh, renewables, are, I think, are very, very important in looking at buildings, public buildings, private buildings, municipal buildings, and perhaps the city became, became, can become uh, a showcase in demonstrating some of these options, but also looking at energy from the point of view of transportation and how we can uh, minimize energy consumption from a transportation perspective and other categories as well. Solar energy, wind energy, hydro energy, biofuels in a variety of uh, forms, uh, and other aspects overall. What are some of our opportunities? What are some of the uh, uh, challenges that we can take advantage of to look at the wise use of energy in a more sustainable way? This is what I look forward to hearing from you about tonight. Thank you. Okay, that was all designed to help give us something to think about for tonight. Um, here's, here's the process that we're, we're going through. <clears throat> for the last two days during the day, um, we wrapped up this afternoon, we've had daytime sessions with uh, stakeholders in the community around these six topics, as, as we mentioned. Um, last night and tonight uh, are the public sessions for people who couldn't be there during the day. And it's really for us, I mean, we're, we're basically done talking. We want to listen now. Um, all of the, the team members are, are going to be writing down your comments. A um, few ground rules I'll get to in a second, um, 
but, but the, the idea of tonight and last night is really to hear from you what related to these six points or just sustainability in general or the strengths of uh, Northampton or, or issues um, that are important for the long term big picture okay, of, of Northampton's sustainability um, do you think need to be, uh, be sure to be included in this. Um, tomorrow during the day we'll be putting together the synthesis, the, the collection and analysis of everything that we've heard the last few days and we'll be pre presenting it tomorrow night at JFK High School in the form of uh, a preliminary, sort of the executive summary if you will, the, the preliminary summary of uh, uh, what we've seen, what we've learned from you, what we think opportunities might be and some suggestions or recommendations for moving forward to, with the, the, uh, the 6 to 12 month planning process that you're starting. Within 60 days you'll have a written report from us courtesy in large part from the staff but with all of our input and review and editing um, and then in about 12 months we'll be back to just do a follow-up visit. In the meantime this is the uh, web address um, if you want to check on anything uh, see how the process is going you can certainly check with the city I'm sure they'll have uh, updates and information available. Um, oh yes sorry www that's abbreviated 6u AIA dot org slash forward slash livable as in livable community so it's AIA dot org forward, forward slash livable right and the email address is simply communities by design all one word communities by design at AIA dot org okay we're gonna dispense with the slides now and yes um, because of the community access people some of the basic ground rules they have asked that everyone please come up to the mic uh, to offer your comment or question All right there's a mic here and there's a mic here on each side so if you would simply uh, if you'd like to say something I'll recognize um, each mic I would ask you to um, if you would please state your name and what the topic is you'd like to address something went ring um, what the topic is you'd like to address and I would like to ask everyone to uh, in the interest of giving everyone a, a chance to talk or to say something um, please keep your comments concise and to the point and I'm going to ask you to limit to about two or three minutes each and if we have more time we can go back um, for a second round but um, obviously a lot of people here we want to give everybody a chance if something happens that uh, or you're not comfortable speaking on the mic or whatever you all have index cards and please feel free to write down a comment or a question um, particularly about whatever uh, the, the topic is and we'll collect those at the end. Fair enough? Okay. The floor is yours. We are we started a few minutes late. Uh, we apologize. Um, we were scheduled to go till 9. Uh, we can maybe go to a few minutes after 9 if people want but we'll try and we'll see how it goes and uh, shoot for rocking up somewhere around 9 o'clock. Who'd like to go first? Don't be shy. Oh yes, oh, people standing in the back. There are plenty of chairs up front. We don't bite, honest. Come on down. <laughs> I hate to give up any time. <laughs> no, a, the mic's over here. Please, oh. mic's over there. You can move it so it's easier to access if you like and just hold it close to your mouth if you will. Okay. Um, my name is Ellen Dibble. I want to speak about transportation, housing, and the elderly. The elderly I consider to be a resource. I hope I'll be a resource. And I've been doing quite a bit of planning on my, on my own, and I realize it may be for other people because I could drop dead. Um, but I want to start by talking about energy and say I live in a one-room apartment with a western face. And I refuse to buy another air conditioner until there's one that uses all that solar heating energy. Um, you, could, you could definitely use that energy someplace or another. Um, where I live, there's no parking, virtually. You have to really need a car to want, to want a car. So I wanted to get the kind of cars they have in Japan, which you can fold up and put in the back of your car. Um, but they're not legal in the United States right now. Um, they're too small, sort of like mopeds. I do see them parking in the parking garage across the street from me. Um, but I have other problems with this kind of car. Um, you have to plug it in if you don't have enough sun. 
and the outlet is in the janitor's closet. I'd have to be the vacuum cleaner to, to, to plug it in. Um, and it's too heavy, the battery's too heavy. And so even if I had it, would I use a bike lane? Is there a bike lane? So I figure, okay, give up on that. Um, I will share a car with somebody. We will have car lots at the end of every street and someone else can shovel out for me. Um, and you can pick up your rent-a-moped when you need it. This depends on a lot of coordination, which I can't do. Um, or I figure I'll live in a house with several other older people who don't need cars every day to get, go to work, and we will share that car. Um, and if we have to go by train, that's too bad, because there's no train station here. And the bus station goes to Springfield where there's not good connections. You should be able to go to Boston or New York, down and back in any day, come back from those places. It's not set up for that. The nearest train station, I think, is in Amherst and not in the center. So this is the transportation problems for people who don't want to have cars because they need the exercise. People who live in the center of town, this, there's this affordable housing that's going up. And I wonder, do they work in town? Or are they putting up affordable housing for people who work in Springfield and therefore need cars anyway? I really wonder about this. In my, in my house, I think everybody works in town if they work at all. Um, and I noticed that, for example, uh, we're, we're probably not um, affordable type people. We save up our money and then move to Prague, or we invest in our next career. Um, and so we hope for cheap housing, not affordable housing. And we see this being lost to condominiums that we can't afford, and there's fewer and fewer and fewer of my breed, so to speak. My next career may be done by the time I'm 75, and then I would like to live in a house with a common room that some older people will share. They have an after-school program for kids um, who can come around and we will have time for them, I hope, and they won't have to taxi us to different places. And I'd also hope to be able to take care of foster kids in this shared common apartment. Um, if you're going to have it, you might as well have it approved. Not to be like Treehouse in, North, in East Hampton, where you have a foster community, but to be able to take emergency cases from all over Western Mass, a grandparent's house, where all the kids will know they're welcome when things go wrong, and we can travel them around and things like that. So it's really it's a, a vision of the future that I can't handle myself, so I hand it over to anyone who wants to help. Thank you very much. Very interesting thoughts there. Would you like to come up to one mic? And many of those thoughts, by the way, in, in one form or another, uh, I'm sure people are seriously taking those because different pieces of those thoughts have emerged in different discussions. So uh, by all means, those in. Uh, my name is David Kotz. Uh, I want to uh, briefly comment on two issues, uh, transportation and recreation. Uh, there, uh, there are a fair number of uh, residents of Northampton. I'm, I'm one of them who uh, works in Amherst at the, the university or elsewhere. And uh, uh, you know, unless you're able to bike year-round, then uh, there really isn't any uh, good uh, alternative uh, for, for most residents, depending on where you live, other than to drive if you don't live right near a bus stop. Uh, I've uh, often wondered if it would be, I know this is kind of a long-run uh, idea, to have a light rail system that ran from uh, downtown Northampton to uh, downtown Amherst and then with jitneys serving the, the two stations. It could uh, seriously uh, reduce the need for cars or quite a few people, and reduce the traffic. Uh, the, uh, the second uh, uh, issue is recreation, and that is uh, we have this wonderful river flowing right alongside our, our city, but there's very little public access to it. Uh, about the only time I get to see it is when I'm stuck in traffic on the Coolidge Bridge. Uh, so I suppose a light rail system would eliminate even that. Uh, so if, if some way could be found to, uh, you know, to get good public access to the Connecticut River, it would be a big improvement, I think, in the quality of life of the city. Thank you. Good. Yes, the corridor between Amherst and, uh, and Northampton uh, is an important topic. And the use of the river is very important on a number of fronts. Please, put one of the You can queue up behind the mics if you'd like, and we'll go back and forth. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Roplica, and I'd like to speak to 
um, land conservation and um, transportation economic, actually. I'm referring specifically to the proposed industrial park on 10 South. I don't know if you saw that on your bus tour up toward East Hampton. And I understand the need for this um, industrial park and for industry in Northampton. Um, and I don't know if it was pointed out to you, it happens to be situated near um, Mass Audubon's Meadows, which is 700 acres of protected open space. Um, it's across the street from that. And it also backs up to a wildlife corridor that sort of stretches up to Northampton's protected Fitzgerald Lake area. And then further on, if you really look toward conservation areas protected in Williamsburg. So it's an important wildlife corridor as well as um, eminently developable open space. So I'm wondering, and I'm told that the city has considered all possible sites, and I believe that, but I'm wondering if there's something to be, there's some help we can get from you in trying to figure out where to put in an industry that doesn't require um, developing open space further and further the outskirts of town. And I, and I wanted to touch on transportation with that because under social equity, I was thinking people who work in industry need to be who need to be able to get to the hardware store, the grocery store, the library. So, you know, to get to their jobs as well as to get to their basic necessities of life. Um, so when you're putting jobs further and further out in the outskirts of town and developing your precious open space, you're also undermining that um, goal of providing access to social necessities. So I see it as a dilemma because I don't know what else is developable in town for industry, but that's my concern. Very good. And yes, it is that balance that becomes important. We're going to go here, and then we can queue up behind the mic. Oh, okay. My name is Milton Hansel. I live in the Bay State neighborhood. I've been in the Northampton area about 20 years, and I've noticed that the traffic, the ability of the town to handle people like me who've moved here, who are driving through, I start to count the number of times I drive through town. And I think about the impact that I have on all the pedestrians there. Um, I'm aware that we need to make some big changes. I have a fantasy of a car-free downtown. That would be, the way things stand now, that would be a death sentence for all of the businesses there. So much for retail. So I'm hoping that the plans that you come up with and some of the brainstorming that you do will be as impractical as a car-free downtown because it may take us seven generations to get there. And it's, it's going to take a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, a lot of planning, jitneys, light rail, all of that stuff, before anybody in their right mind would even consider doing it. So we, it's a long road. Um, likewise, with affordable housing, um, one of the things sustainability means to me is that they, the people growing up here can also afford something when it comes time to buy a house. I don't know about the legalities, for instance, of, of uh, affordable housing having preferences for people who live here or for people who work here. I hope there would be some way to address some of those questions as well um, and, and have goals for, for having that be sustainable in that way. Thank you. Very good. This side. Hi, my name is Leslie Freidstern. I live over on Calvin Terrace. I guess I want to spend my time not so much on what I would hope for for the future, but really encouraging the group to be as rigorous as possible in your recommendations and what you write up. And so I spent just a couple of minutes going through what I have in front of me, and I want to use some examples of what I think is less than rigorous thinking. Um, you know, it's a tough issue because there's so many conflicting desires, even on something like affordable housing. Yes, we want affordable housing, but when we sell our own homes, my God, we hope there'll be six bidders, you know, and it goes for 750000 So these are tough issues. There are dilemmas built in, but I want to mention a couple of things in terms of rigorous thinking. Smith College has a vested interest in making positive improvements to the area around the college, including downtown. Do give some, dem do give some examples, because some of us haven't seen their vested interest. To give you just one small example, this is very much an arts community. And so you have downtown a number of shops uh, dealing with tourists who are coming interest in, interested in art, interested in boutique -y kinds of things. Well, Smith College just has a brand new museum, lovely museum. They could have built it without a museum shop. 
but they built it with a museum shop, even though that will take away, and does take away, from the income of all these boutique owners downtown that we're trying to encourage. Phrases like, not in my backyard mentality, is really, I think, insulting. Invariably, when a large entity wants to do something, the people who oppose it are immediately accused of not in my, that way they don't have to defend or support by argument, by reason, what it is that they, that why it's good. But they put down people who are asking tough questions. So I think insofar as you adopt that idea that that's a real problem, that not in my backyard mentality, at least demonstrate where instead of just using the phrase. Two and a half uh, property tax increase on existing uh, puts pressure on cities to promote sprawl in order to balance budgets. Not true. At least not if by sprawl you mean housing. <laughs> Invariably, new housing puts more pressure on budgets. You could say in terms of industry, if that's what you meant by sprawl. But don't get the idea that new, unless they're senior citizens' developments, new housing invariably puts more pressure on a small town in terms of educational expenses and all the rest. I'll go quickly. Um, Can I just make a comment? Sure, um, of course. That what you're referring to is, um, is actually a summary of notes um, of things that we heard. Ann and I were here in August. And what you're reading from are not our words, they're really okay. the words that we heard here. Okay, I took, uh, maybe I misunderstood, I took suggestions offered by local participants as being the words of the local community. I was reading it is the, it is the from local strengths and opportunities versus weaknesses and threats. Yeah, okay, that, those were things that were uh, from the local participants okay. uh, or from the, uh, the application that was submitted. Okay. So those, those are things that that were presented to us to address, so, so you're addressing them appropriately. I just I, want to I understand. Okay. All right. Current market rents can't necessarily justify the cost of developing new and commercial and renovated commercial space. Again, numbers would be helpful in terms of what kind of market rents, what is the break-even point for commercial developers to come in. Um, going quickly. Many families send their children to Northampton schools even though they don't live in Northampton, increasing costs without increasing tax income. Now, I know that's not true, at least I think that's not true. When Northampton residents go elsewhere, we have, the city has to send money. Same way the school board decided to accept people so that we would get money from the other communities. So I don't know where that statement comes from, but again, be rigorous. Now, this may have been just in Florence, I don't know, concern about recent population growth. It's listed on the Florence, and maybe the population of Florence, but every census that comes along, every year we think, well, it's going to be more than 30. It's always the same, you know, or we go down a little. I mean, we're in that 29,000 population range, and I think have been for about three, whatever the plural of census is, sensi, I don't know. It's actually approaching 50 years, which all over Is it that really? Four so, years. And the last two things, very little discussion of the relevance and the importance of the arts. And even the building that you showed, 221 Pine Street, there may be some businesses in there, but overwhelmingly, yeah. these are artist studios and not really businesses. I mean, there may be some, but that's not a perfect example of... Uh, of uh, cultivating small businesses that you hope will grow. And lastly, and this is just off, off on a tangent, but what the heck. Wait, wait. Um, the notion that businesses are suffering in terms of health costs because of our sedentary lifestyle, which is based, who is selling us the sedentary lifestyle? <laughs> who is making the video games? Who are, a whole lot of things. So, just to somehow say that business, those poor business, their you know, defenseless victims of uh, our sedentary lifestyle is hardly uh, uh, the case. I understand. Um, just to clarify the process, we are, um, before we print the final report, anything that appears to be a factual statement, we are doing the rigorous checks and asking local sources rather to make sure we verify anything before we would suggest anything based on uh, a statement or, or a bit of data. And a lot of the issues that you talked about are what uh, will be 
delving into deeper tomorrow before we make the preliminary recommendations. Um, just a, a comment about the population. Uh, yes, the, the data that we've seen, and it seems to be supportable, is that for almost 50 years, the population has been about 30,000 in, in Northampton. The number of households has increased. Okay? The number of cars have increased. Families are getting smaller. Households are getting smaller. Um, the people, it's not the same 30,000 people. There's been a lot of moving in, moving out for any number of reasons. Okay, that's just, uh, those are just observations, those are observable facts. The question then becomes, okay, to look at the long-term view, how do we take those observable facts, trends, and patterns, look at it in the context of these other things we're talking about, and long-term sustainability, do the rigorous uh, analysis to say, okay, what's the right way to move forward? Is it always going to be 30,000 people of one type or another, or is it going to be something different? And what, what's the plan for it? That's over here. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Harrity. I live in Leeds. And uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, efforts of the mayor, Wayne, Carol, and the staff at planning for, the, for their efforts in this. Uh, they've got a lot to do. I know this is a lot more to do. Um, uh, I'd like to address the issue of uh, representative sampling. Um, I can imagine that a final report like this may have uh, a lot of weight as far as the direction of Northampton goes. Um, I would suggest that uh, 175 participants of the public hearing may be self-selected sample, and your focus groups may also be self-selected, and that uh, there's some processes in place to account for your error in your sample, whether it's some kind of a survey or, God forbid, some kind of a referendum to the voters in adopting the plan. But um, I think that uh, given the weight that this uh, final report may have on the that the uh, sample error should be accounted for in some way or another. Thanks. Fair enough. I will just point out this is the beginning of the, the ongoing process, so it won't be just this effort. So there will be more opportunities for people to participate, I'm sure. Over here. Good evening. My name is James Lowenthal. I'm uh, about half a mile from here. Uh, this is my uh, daughter, Mel, two and a half, and with bedtime fast approaching. Uh, I'll try and keep this brief. Uh, first, I also want to acknowledge the efforts of uh, the Mayor and the Planning Department and yourselves for uh, this undertaking and uh, to express how grateful I am to live in a community where this is important and where the city has, has taken this on as, as uh, an important set of issues. So specifically about sustainability, uh, as somebody who, who thinks about this a lot every day, uh, I, I have long ago reached the conclusion that at the core of, of sustainability issues is transportation. I'm glad to see that as, as so uh, acknowledged by, uh, by, by everything you've discussed in, in, in the handout already. It's at the crux of, of, of all sustainability issues, including uh, energy, the environment, including public health, including economic sustainability. So just to consider economics, for instance, the average American household spends uh, over $4,000 per year on a car. That's $40 million in Northampton, roughly. So, uh, and that's from all indications I've seen in the last month, since the oil prices have gone up so dramatically, that's only going to get higher. And who knows, maybe we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and so very quickly, that, that, that amount exceeds the whole budget of Northampton. And just think what those dollars could be going to instead. So in, uh, it seems to me that we have no choice but to provide for other modes of transportation than the expensive ones than, that, we've been, uh, that, that we've been focusing on so much for, for the past generations. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing all the, uh, the various efforts that you'll, or, or suggestions you'll make for how we get, <laughs> how we get there from here. Uh, and I recognize that there's competition. You know, people, people may feel, well, we have to, you know, if, if we don't provide more parking in downtown, people will just drive to the malls where parking is free. But in the long view, of course, the malls are completely unsustainable. We already have a compact downtown where 40% of the population lives within one mile of downtown. Very walkable uh, uh, and, and bikeable. Uh, sort of scenario, and we have to do everything we can to preserve that. But how do we do it while not sacrificing our, our economic vitality of the downtown, for instance, in the short term? Thank you. Uh, Mel, did you have something else to say? Do you want to tell? Would you like to mention what kind of uh, what kind of city you would like? <laughs> not tonight. Next time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, hi, um, I have uh, three comments: one environmental, one economic, and one social. Okay. Um, short term is a uh, is economic. We have lots of um, people in the area, in the region, who are working on the sustainable energy. So I'd kind of like to see us use like a one resource, would be, would be like the parking in downtown that people aren't crazy about. 
and sort of turn into maybe like um, have reserved parking spaces for like pie deep or something like that. So people who are doing something like a little pat on the back and that can sort of promote sort of local industry at the same time because maybe that will get people kind of to go buy biodiesel, which is a lot of being made here. Uh, environmental long-term concern is how much faith we are putting in the state uh, agricultural preservation restriction program. That is a creature of the legislature, and um, a two-thirds vote of the legislature wipes out any protection that exists. So uh, I would like to see maybe Northampton planning proactively for that, um, maybe legal defenses to APRs, having fund for that, or having some sort of self-supporting uh, land preservation program. And thirdly, uh, social, which would be the, the uh, problem of homelessness, which is uh, the problem of homelessness, which is in the area. And we do have um, resources like the community gardens, and maybe having sort of plots dedicated to, to um, feeding homeless people in the area, or maybe sort of giving them a plot to take care of for themselves, and maybe giving them a chance to sell at the farmer's market. I don't know. So those are my three comments. Very good. Thanks for covering the diversity of things. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Tom Hartley. I'm uh, out of Rocky Hill Co-Housing, and I have a special interest, uh, let me say, a particular interest, I don't want to get mopped in the parking lot, um, in what happens to the neighborhoods between um, well, I should say, I live out near Florence Road, and I'm interested in what happens to the neighborhoods between me and town. Um, I know that there's going to be growth, and I'd like to be smart growth, and uh, I know that we already know a lot about what that means, and I won't add anything to that. Um, I'm really worried about energy shortages. I think, um, I didn't really get it until I read a couple of books on the subject, but I think we have a lot to worry about in terms of um, the price of oil, and shortages of oil, and there's probably a lot of pain coming. Um, I'd like to see whatever we do as a city to um, help mitigate those the problems that we're going to have feeding ourselves when we can't really easily ship or fly food from, Argen from Argentina. And I do have a lot to say about um, Walmart and Hadley and the best farmland in the world that's over there, but I don't have anything constructive to say about it, so I won't. Um, <laughs> I think the only constructive suggestion I had was in terms of the Hospital Hill development, I think that there's a lot of good stuff that could be done with that um, to make it, to, to use a lot of innovations that, would, that tons of ideas are flying around about making it um, pedestrian friendly and bike friendly to have bike through ways. Um, maybe even to, I think that there was an idea flying around that we could allow additional housing units on that site, provided that the developers um, include more of these ideas. And I'm also especially interested in um, mixed-use zoning. Like, wouldn't it be great if there was a, a hardware store and a grocery store, like, within that development? Um, it could be a destination in itself, um, and you could get a lot of stuff that you need that you can't really buy in Northampton anymore. Thanks. Very good. Thank you for keeping it constructive. Okay, now for a different note. Okay. <laughs> I'm, at, I'm Mike Kirby. Okay. There's a kind of there's a kind of a universal reverence for planning, and uh, and anybody that has been through the real life struggles within the community know that how decisions are made have very little to do with planning and the planning process. That. One epic example is that slide that you show of 221 Pine Street. That occurred because there was a neighborhood organization that I was involved in. Uh, they tried to, the, it was the end of the uh, 80s and, and developers wanted to change that over to condominiums. And there was a fight over zoning. This was one of the rare fights I've been in that I won. <laughs> I've been on a losing battle in this community on more sides. And now I think that if I just invest myself, I understand, oh yes, you want this, it won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want to say, before I run out of time, everybody runs out of patience. I saw the ZBA the other night deal with the situation in Smith College expansion. And we had a charrette in which a lot of creative ideas were done by a Boston <coughs> of how to make industrial, like a 
lab space fit into an existing community. And, you know, how to, how to do things sanely. But when the time came to come, when push came to shove, this, this ZBA and the planning board both had civilized conversations. And then all of a sudden, everybody's hand went up like this. That in real life, a lot of times, institutions and communities will ignore. And that's what they <coughs> did with the whole Smith expansion. They ignored the, the charrettes that had been done in the 90s. They ignored the land use thing. They ignored they, they tried to pretend that a building built in, a, in an area where you have 25 foot limit and I think it's neighborhood business and 40 and URC that this 66 foot building, huge building, fit in all right. Well, it's reasonable. So I'll close with this, okay? And say that in real life, in this community, the people, the, the movers and shakers, are the developers. And they make things happen. And a lot of times, little people get ground under, no matter what the zoning is. Be much louder. That's, we appreciate all the comments, and this is a chance for everyone to be heard. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Halpin. I'm uh, from Leeds. Uh, I wanted to address um, historic preservation, uh, not because I think it's necessarily the most um, uh, the most important aspect of sustainability, but I think it is important and relevant, um, and I'm worried that it might not uh, come up otherwise. Um, essentially, historic preservation is. Uh, recycling on a grand scale, um, and uh, given the amount of material and energy that goes into construction, um, I think it's very important that we not uh, waste uh, existing buildings. Uh, and historic preservation is something that Northampton has really been pretty good about uh, for the most part uh, recently, but I would like to see it um, sort of codified in some way in this planning process. Um, and I think perhaps more importantly, um, we should be thinking about the way that we build uh, new construction so that it is something that we uh, will, for one thing, want to keep around for a long time, and secondly, that we build it in a manner in that it will um, last for a long time uh, so, that, um, uh, uh, so that we will be um, building for more than just one generation. As I understand it, uh, a lot of the standard construction methods uh, which are employed today um, have a life expectancy of uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and it would be nice to see, and I realize this is again something that's fairly difficult to achieve through a planning process, um, buildings that will last for seven generations. So. Very good. All the architects here say you have a future in architecture. <laughs> Over here. Hi, my name is Deborah Wilson. I live in Florence. Um, I guess I have a quick question for you. When you throw the word sustainability around, does that include maintaining what is? That's been um, discussed a lot. Um, the idea is to maintain a quality of life, but actually to improve it, to be sure that what we're doing, it's, a, it's a, been described as a mindset. It's the, the thought that we don't inherit our environment or the planet or, or our conditions from our grandparents. We borrow them from our grandchildren. Okay. So the sustainability is, is the long-term picture for economic, social, and environmental issues. Okay, then I guess I'd like to present something to you and ask you very, very seriously to address this. With the development that is going on, the houses on Florence Road, Route 66, and West Farms Road have a serious drop in water pressure because more people are using water. Surprise! Does this not work into the development? And is that not the development's cost? We are told that we need to get pumps in our houses that have been there. I don't call that sustainability. And I'm asking you to seriously address this. Another thing that's happening, we have the dump out there. 
there's a road that goes to the dump. The roads that go to the dump are used by not only the entire town, but by large trucks. Now, 10 years ago, the trucks that went over those roads were dump trucks, were smaller trucks. Now, the trucks that go over that road are 18 wheelers, and they are carrying serious loads. That is destroying the road. Now, for eight years, no, maybe 10 years, we have asked that that road be taken care of. They fill the potholes in such a messy way that now when the trucks hit the bumpy potholes, the houses shake. Eight years. And granted, they fill the potholes, but they don't do it properly. And so it actually causes more noise and more problems. Now, these roads in Northampton, in the areas that Northampton is looking at, building, these roads have houses on them that are very close to the roads. They are old country roads. And the sound is a serious problem. The weight of these trucks is a serious problem. If we are sustaining the homes that are already built, please address these issues and talk to them about what is the responsibility for the infrastructure of the developers when it impacts the people who already live there. Now, it's not only that, <laughs> but... I, yes, I know, but th there's some, a couple other serious issues. Um, we're being told... Let me say 99, maybe we'll lose my thumb, I'm going to have to come back to that. Um, Oh, when they tested the pressure, their town is telling us the pressure's okay. They tested it at 6 o'clock in the morning when people don't use it. I mean, I would like to see a guideline that says, if we are going to sustain the quality of life that's going on right now, please give appropriate measures, measures and please put something in there so that the public can actually have something to, to um, force the town to respond to because the democracy does not necessarily work in this town unless you're a friend of the developer. And you can talk to Wayne Fiden about, um, about the recent uh, work of uh, Bill Willard bulldozing the wetlands. And the response to that was they allowed him to expand. Okay. Okay, thank you for your passion and concern. Um, I can assure you that all of those types of issues are things that we have been looking at and addressing. I cannot promise, because of the complexity of those things, that we're going to come up with solutions in three days. That's not uh, likely. Um, but we can certainly uh, be sure that things like that are included for uh, the overall planning process and the continued exploration of how to find the solutions. Hi, my name is Jonathan Black. Um, and I wanted to focus on the social equity aspect of sustainability. And in the interest of being concise, I've prepared something. Um, and to start out, I'd just like to say that this is my second night coming to these meetings, workshops. And I'd like to say that there's a lot of excellent ideas that people are bringing up and suggesting, um, which to me begs the question of, what types of governmental mechanisms are needed to ensure that this participation is acted upon over the long term? Um, you know, a critical component of social equity concerns the opportunities residents have uh, to participate in decision making. Um, and I would also stress that perhaps more important is the city's response. Uh, by creating clear mechanisms to implement people's ideas, the city can translate this participation into action thereby demonstrating its value. Um, so let's do what we can to make sure that this lively public input is not just neatly filed on a shelf somewhere in City Hall, uh, but that it becomes a living document that truly informs our future. Um, so that being said, you know, there's been a lot of concern expressed about the impacts of Smith College's campus master planning on Northampton's master planning. Um, so I would just like to 
present a question as to how we, we as a community can ensure that Smith's future development is conducted in concert with community interests. Um, you know, in addition to the parking crisis that has plagued neighborhoods surrounding the campus since the mid-80s, Smith's recent projects, uh, which include the West Street Parking Garage, Campus Center on Elm Street, and most recently their plans to demolish the Green Street neighborhood, have, prevented other, have presented other grievances. In particular, the Green Street neighborhood is worth mention because it's a paragon of all that we're talking about while examining what sustainability means in Northampton. Uh, proximity to town town, mixed uses, pedestrian scale and walkability, neighborhood businesses, a diversity of mixed income housing, and in this case, downtown's only remaining stock of market rate affordable housing. Uh, no matter how much money Smith throws at the city, or how many commitments to subsidize replacement housing they make, limited availability of land in the downtown area clearly indicates that we will not be able to replace this neighborhood. Now, um, because Smith has granted broad privileges as a nonprofit academic institution, they've been able to pursue development that defies city objectives, which aim to safeguard this community's health and vitality. And uh, it's worth mentioning also that the city's attempts at community involvement regarding Smith's plans, and those being uh, the ad hoc working group and the West Street planning charrette. Both of these ultimately failed to be effective vehicles for a participatory process. Um, and the reason why is, although it's true that the public was involved, um, it's important to carefully examine the quality of the involvement offered by these meetings. If you consider the timeline of Smith's planning process, the public was included only after all decisions of any substance were made. And then their input was effectively dismissed because it didn't fit with what they already had been decided. Um, and it's also interesting to point out that all measures to mitigate for Smith's expansion, these include uh, you know, replacement housing and payment in lieu of taxes, all of these things were negotiated privately and then presented to the public, presupposing that we would be accepting and consensual. So again, I ask the question, you know, how as, we, how, as a community, can we ensure that Smith's future development is conducted in concert with community's interests? And I believe that the answer lies in Smith committing to involve the public from the beginning of their planning process and to remain open, responsive, and inclusive of the feedback that they receive. And I believe it's also the responsibility of city government to urge them to do so. So, that being said, I pushed aside. Um, the last thing I want to say is, neighborhoods are invaluable community assets that serve as building blocks for manifesting what we envision for the city. In many ways, neighborhoods determine the fabric of our community, and they are the incub incubators and sustaining environments for our residents and social equity. Accordingly, I believe that the creation of neighborhood councils that are included in the decision-making processes of the city would be a step towards actualizing the possibilities offered by civic participation and inclusiveness. Each council could work independently to create goals for their respective part of the city, assessing and solving problems that are specific to each neighborhood. And they could also work jointly to achieve common needs and interests. I think that an organization of neighborhood councils would be a clear expression of the important role neighborhoods play in both preserving and strengthening our community. Thank you. part of the planning process to include all the points of view. Good evening. My name is Bob Mellowin. I'm one of the original 30,000 in Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you folks for um, your time and, and what you're able to put forward to us to, to look at. I think that's very important and, and uh, I think everybody should appreciate that. Um, I really want to talk about economic development. Um, I own a couple of businesses in, in this city, and we certainly always talk about affordable housing. Um, but businesses need affordable places to do business. And if the local hardware store isn't around any longer, um, that's going to impact the community in, in disastrous ways. Uh, we don't need 
to go to a Home Depot 20 or 30 miles away when we need a screwdriver. Um, I would like to see a closer tie between Northampton and Florence. Um, they seem to be a world away to me, um, and yet they're, they're in the same community. Maybe a, um, a light rail that connects those two communities so that uh, it would be easy to pass from one to the other. Um, certainly, as, as people have complained about bike paths in the, in the past, uh, I think that they've been very beneficial on many levels, and connecting the bike paths that, that exist in this community now to be intertwined could also be helpful. Um, I'm not here to complain at all. I still think that Northampton is one of the best places to live, and I hope it will continue to be so. Um, and I don't look at uh, situations that um, Smith College is doing uh, as being the enemy. I think that there probably could be a little more um, conversation about some of the things, but uh, they certainly are very important to, um, to economic future of this city. Um, so I would say economically we need to be very sensi sensible to the business is in the area so that they can prosper, prosper to bring more jobs and, and a, a better way of life uh, to the folks of Northampton and, and the community. Thank you. Very good. All about balance. Over here. Yes, my name is Frank Overs. I'm a native, now Ward 7. And uh, there was an interesting uh, comment I read once in the President's Council for Environmental Quality. It was one of their annual reports back in the 70s. And it said, I thought, if I remember correctly, that when 50% of the area of a, of a city or town gets developed, then the free goods that are supplied by the environment become um, uh, less, less effective and the social costs start to rise significantly because you have to replace water with filtration and, and a whole lot of other things. I'm sure you, some of you may know a lot about that, much more than I do, but in your report I would suggest you address that that it's actually a very fundamental characteristic of populations that the density or the uh, amount of land used becomes negative, uh, a negative element of the development of the area. And basically that's a tragedy of the commons issue where you, ex you start, uh, you externalize the costs originally, but then when you, when you grow too big, you have to start internalizing and so the growth becomes much more uh, costly. And um, with respect to Kirby's uh, talk, because you're, you know, uh, national and you have a lot of uh, background, we here do have a very intense planning process and as you know, there's a lot of articulate people and that sort of thing, but generally speaking, we don't go below the surface. So, for example, very often when the city deals with the development and the community says, gee, that's bad for us and it's bad for the city, the city will turn around and say, our hands are tied. We can't change certain things. Now, some of them are obvious, which is the state laws. But I hope that in your report, you lay out the things that are uh, obstacles to good development. And they may very well be national laws or state laws or even our own um, uh, statutes in the city that prevent us from having good development or good uh, good life. When you raise our matters of policy in media, the uh, question will come up today whether or not it would be appropriate for us to include matters of policy in our uh, review and discussion. And I can assure you that yes, that is part of the mix. And um, an important one, very important, because uh, policies are not just set locally, they're set statewide and nationally. Over here. Hello, my name is Sarah Martha. Um, just a couple points I want to get on the record. Um, one is that I see an apparent conflict, an economic conflict, between open space and affordable housing. Um, the more 
restricted land we have can be built on raises the prices of the properties. Um, one way to perhaps deal with this might be to increase density downtown. Where would you do that? You'd have to go up. I'd like to hear some discussion about possibly increasing the height limit on buildings in town. Uh, of course, if, you know you would want to block some of the sunlight, etc. There'd be long discussions on this. Um, I like hearing about mixed use, increasing the mixed use of the building that Joe talked about. Um, I see grandfathered small businesses in neighborhoods, a little grocery store, all by itself because it's grandfathered and nothing can go around it to support it. Um, I think it'd be nice to see a little more creative thinking on, on how we can allow these mixed uses. Um, and lastly, something uh, Bill brought up about uh, thinking of building, and this might be a building code issue along the lines of making buildings that last, I'd like to see some, some thought about buildings that are adaptable in terms of not just their use, say uh, an abandoned factory, getting it, uh, adapting it, uh, physically adapting it for other uses, or um, making buildings so that they can be taken apart and the materials actually reused rather than put in the dumpster. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Pat Rowan. I've been in the uh, house I'm in since 1960 in Florence. Well, actually, not the whole time, but I live in the house that our family moved into in 1960. And um, and come up with a couple of first names that I ever heard, Garlman and all that, so are here. Um, what, uh, I, I'm joining this process kind of late because I just learned about it in the paper and I haven't really been able to focus my attention on it, so I really have kind of a peripheral comment to make and, um, and so I'm just kind of a heads up and I'm interested in knowing whether uh, people are uh, paying attention to this aspect of planning. Um, When I think of downtown Hamp or any part of Hamp and its desirability to live in, I think of how good it looks. Uh, I hate to be superficial, but it looks good. It's a, it's a great appearing place. You drive around and you see things that are pretty and it's nice to be in. Uh, I've seen the traffic change dramatically over the past 45 years. Um, and I've also noticed a huge change in the nighttime environment. And I was wondering if anyone has been addressing the nighttime environment. Everything we're talking about, the infrastructure, the, uh, the traffic flow, the kind of housing, all these are very important. I was wondering if anybody has looked at it from the point of view after the sun goes down. And that is specifically uh, looking at artificial lighting, and how uh, efficient that lighting is and how wasteful it is. And we're talking about energy conservation, sustainability, attractiveness, all of these things have to do with good quality nighttime lighting and uh, not wasting the resources to light uh, neighbor's yards or uh, the, the valley across the, across the river or the sky and losing our stars. I was just wondering if anybody has been looking at that. Um, light pollution in general is, is part of sustainability. Um, I don't know if you have an ordinance in, in town or not. We could look into that. But it is um, uh, uh, part of the energy portion. I know that uh, has been talked about a bit in terms of appropriate use of energy for lighting, other ways to, to generate it so it's not creating fossil uh, fuel waste, but also the, the quality of what we're doing. Downward directing light is becoming a very common requirement in a lot of um, municipalities and localities just for the very reason you're saying. Folks that where it needs to be, not where we don't want it. And that, that would really bring Northampton to the forefront of uh, modern thinking, I think. Sure. Be very progressive and forward-looking. Very good. Thank you. Over here. Hello, uh, my name's Aiden. Uh, I'm a student at the UMA uh, UMass University across the river. I'm also a father, and in a couple months I will stop being a student and be a full-time resident. So I'm very Love to say I'm very concerned with affordability and that sort of thing. The four issues I want to uh, 
talked about our one green building uh, and one building techniques. Sorry. Um, <laughs> two is uh, <laughs> two is uh, higher density uh, residential development, particularly, and three is uh, development. That big word. Uh, the people that pull a lot of weight in this community. Um, I think a lot of us feel like we're going up against developers. And uh, four is uh, incentives. And uh, through zoning or uh, that's not the right term, uh, how we can find economic incentives to promote these things. So first, green building. This last gentleman spoke at Human Lake, and I heard you say Northampton can be a model town. And uh, I really believe that's true. And I think that uh, green building is a way to make that happen very visually uh, because it stands out. And by green building, I mean uh, uh, buildings that last, energy efficient, energy efficiency, alternative energy, all that. Um, so creating that as a model, and how do we do that? And that goes into development. And how do my question is, and I really don't know, is how do we change a mainstream mindset in development? And how do we say it makes sense to do things sustainably um, and ecologically and uh, also uh, economically. And I, I know that there have been many tests, especially in Europe, showing that um, ecological buildings are more cost effective for long term and practical. Um, so, taking it back to stuff, the higher density uh, uh, residences in town, uh, maintaining walkability, I think that attributes to or solves uh, with many transportation issues. I'd like to see um, my sort of vision of the high density or ecological housing, which include mixed use um, gardens. I'm not familiar with the term permaculture, uh, but incorporating that sort of uh, model. Um, <coughs> yeah, OK. Um, another aspect of uh, sustainability which I want to touch upon is community. And uh, just pointing to Portland, Oregon, and there's uh, Cedar <coughs> Care efforts out there. It's a very grassroots organization that's helping uh, uh, communities uh, be more sustainable. And I think our area is uh, ready for it. I brought some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and they're in Seattle now, too. Thank you. Um, for those that are interested in learning more about green buildings, the U.S. Green Building Council, usgbc.org, has a lot of information about that. Uh, I encourage you to look at that as to how it, how people's uh, minds get changed or mainstream gets changed. It starts with programs like this and opportunities like this. Um, one of the things that has come up repeatedly the last few days is how to educate um, people not only locally but regionally as well about the benefits of um, uh, what we're calling sustainability, some of this mindset saying, well, business as usual isn't really acceptable anymore. We want something that's that's better, that's more sustainable. Go ahead. Greetings and welcome. Um, my name is Paige Bridgens, and um, I've lived in Northampton for 25 years, and I'm excited about this possibility of looking at um, crafting a future for Northampton. Um, I attended some of the workshops this morning and this afternoon and um, and it was good. Um, I did feel as though um, I, I want us to begin to look at this really difficult issue of the fact of depletion. We're facing a very different future um, as we reach peak oil and begin to face the fact that the global supply of petroleum is running out. The available supply is not going to be, it's not going to last as long as the 150 years of this wonderful ascent. So much of what we enjoy when, we are, when we're downtown and there's that upbeat feeling, this is the abundance that was created with cheap oil. We're really enjoying it, and it's, it's been fabulous. And we're facing a very different time. And, and I think that as we look into the seventh generation beyond ours, 
we need to take that into consideration, and it's not easy. Life without petroleum means the beginnings of decay. Decay of our roads, our infrastructure. What about food? Some young man here talked about food being, you know, traveling from Argentina and from all parts of the world and being produced by petroleum and natural gas. That's not going to be able to happen in the future. And, and I want us to begin the work of thinking about how to relocalize. It is in relocalization that the post-petroleum, an effective post-petroleum culture will begin to form. And, and it will involve all of this. It's going to affect every, every facet of our lives. And, 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 you know, I mean, it's really uncomfortable for me to be talking about this, and, and yet I, somebody has to. We need to be talking about it. We can't just keep blissfully going on talking about economic development as if, as if we're starting from status quo and going towards even more status quo. A growth economy is built on available energy. Petroleum is not going to be as available, natural gas, and those are the linchpins for civilization as we've created it. It's going to be hard work to reconfigure. It's, there can also be some really cool things. We can begin to grow food in our neighborhoods. This is what Cuba did when they lost petroleum. They began to grow food in every little niche. And now 90% of the food consumed in Havana was grown in Havana. And we can do that here. We can look at things like Smith Vocational School and turn that into a CSA, where these young people are learning how to grow food and how to, in an authentic setting, get it out to the people in their, in their community. We could have the culinary department at Smith Vocational taking some of that food and, and helping the rest of us learn how to preserve food instead of always buying preserved food, you know, food that's at the supermarket. It's not going to be as available. So I want to invite us all, and I'm talking to all y'all, and I'm talking to you all people in uh, cable TV land, and, <laughs> and you all, I, I want to invite us also to join the work that's already in motion about this, the relocalization movement, the uh, bioregional movement, um, the community solutions movement, and to really do the hard work of informing ourselves about what's going on with petroleum. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing those insights. Um, I see at least three more people who'd like to say things. Um, uh, if we keep it to two or three minutes a piece, that'll bring us just about to nine o'clock. Um, we can keep on going for a few more minutes past that if you like. But in the meantime, if you have anything that um, you'd like to be sure gets uh, acknowledged, please use the index cards, write them down, either on your way out, hand them to um, uh, Terry. <laughs> Okay, hand them to Terry, or if you're close, you can hand them to one of us up front. I want to make sure they get included in the mix. Okay, we'll go to this side. Um, my name is Jan Stetson, and uh, I've lived in town for almost 50 years. Um, and I just wanted to say something about, I, it's been a controversial issue here, and nobody said anything exactly about it, but um, somehow reusing the old hospital, uh, the old buildings at the state hospital. Um, I grew out, up uh, out on Route 66, and I'm kind of afraid to even go out there anymore because all the, how the development of McMansions and stuff are so ugly. And I've recreated a lot of the state hospital over the years using the, um, the uh, land to walk my dogs on and run. And I think just as much as land, uh, old buildings are um, where, and once they're gone, they're gone. And even if we can't um, reuse all of old Maine, would it be possible to, uh, people have been talking about recycling building materials, like using parts of the facade or the bricks or something like that, not just have some new generic little um, 
buildings there. And because it's so close to downtown and to the old buildings at Smith, um, I'd just like to see some more creative thought put into how to reuse the, those facades or the something about those buildings. So, so. Um, if that didn't come through in the presentation, I can share that uh, uh, the hospital site has uh, um, actually gotten a lot of attention and um, will likely be a, uh, a notable part of what we talk about tomorrow night in the report. So thank you for pointing that out. Hi, uh, my name is Fran Ryan. I've only been here for 22 years. <laughs> um, I live in Florence and I'm an environmental educator. So uh, my particular bent is that there's a strong educational component to whatever we do. Um, because I think the more effective we are at reaching uh, community members, the more effective we are at generating ideas, sharing ideas about uh, sustainability, and really informing people as to what it is and, and where we want to go with all this. Um, it also just encourages more participation and more buy-in to the whole idea. Um, my, my particular interest in the educational part of things is with regard to um, the interface between uh, citizens of Northampton and the wildlife. Um, probably one of the best ways, best indicators to a healthy environment, healthy ecosystem is a healthy wildlife population. I think that, that we have a pretty healthy wildlife population here um, and would like to keep it that way. Unfortunately, there's often a disconnect between the uh, what people know about living with wildlife and the animals that are uh, actually here. Um, oftentimes, problems come up where, you know, typical, every spring, bears come out and nobody knows how to deal with it and there's a wildlife expert called in and then this happens again and again. Um, a lot of, com some communities have uh, bear safe programs where it's actually, um, the, the town or city itself has a, a very strong educational component um, so that it's not just dealing with one individual person or, or problem as it comes up, but it's really integrated into the, uh, the way the town looks at the interface between human population and wildlife population. And it would be great if when we're thinking about sustainability that we think about um, uh, the wildlife neighbors as well and how we're going to keep them around, live safely and, and harmoniously with each other in terms of the wild population. Very good. Good point. We, we have learned you have a very healthy salamander population here um, that is uh, wonderfully celebrated, um, but there's a lot more wildlife than just those, and those are significant issues. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Craig Roberti. Um, I suppose this is just a comment. Uh, um, I, I view sustainability as, as a journey, but I think one of the challenges associated with it is how do you know when you've arrived? And so, you know, what are the things that we're going to measure to evaluate progress towards these goals, this plan that we're outlining, that we're laying out here tonight, or that will be formalized at some point? So I suppose some of the things that you listed earlier could be considered the performance indicators, the things that we would evaluate, but what are the tangible things that we would measure to achieve or to evaluate achieving this, this goal of sustainability? And I guess the other, the other piece of this would be the importance of evaluating this on a periodic basis to, to assess our progress towards, towards that goal of sustainability. Thank you. Very good. Over here. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Voss. I'll uh, keep it very brief here. Um, there's been a lot of comments on energy use and a lot of, it's on a lot of our minds um, because our bills are going up. And, uh, I think I don't share the dire view that we're about to run out of oil. But what I do see is, uh, from looking into this quite a bit, that we're going to see more and more higher in prices, and it's going to eat into other things. We're going to lose teachers in our schools. We're going to not paint our buildings as often. The asphalt's going to be more expensive, and we're not going to pave our roads as often. And it's going to cut into a lot of things that we really care about. And so I really think that focus on fuel and energy, whether it's from an environmental perspective or an economic perspective, is incredibly important. And um, I just wanted to speak very briefly is what I see as one of the very strongest medicines that we can take. And it may be too strong, but I think we could try it in some areas of some new development. And that is really uh, try to create uh, car-free uh, developments in, in, in little areas. And we have a model of this. Uh, everywhere across the country, we have uh, college campuses that are very effective, uh, high-grade research. Uh, incredibly pr productive environments and low-cost infrastructure because the colleges have to pay for their own roads. So they, 
they don't build stoplights, they don't they build walking paths, and I think uh, we may uh, be able to learn a few lessons from that. Not everything's applicable, but there's a few things that, um, and we have some examples right in town that we can look at pedestrian oriented environments where you don't see cars when you walk outside. And I wonder if some pockets of, of development could um, move in that direction. Certainly we have pathways take a good step in that direction. And that's one way to really, really uh, very seriously cut down on energy dependency and, and, uh, and give people some choices on how they live. Thanks. Very good. I see one more person, unless anyone else wants to speak. I'll take this as the last comment. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ed Hagelstein. Some of you know me. Um, I want to uh, thank you first for, I think you have put forth a Spartan effort here with the hours you put in and everything else. And I, we all really appreciate the effort you put in. Um, I would ask, uh, well, let me uh, say that um, when you first started your first presentation, you uh, explained that the charrette meant a little card. And, uh, We've had previous experiences with uh, charrettes in this town over the years, and uh, some of them have not really come out as credible as we would have liked to. And uh, there are some now in town who feel that when you talk about a charrette, it, it kind of implies that somebody's going to be taken for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, there are two controversial issues in town uh, at this moment. Uh, one is the Smith College expansion. And I would ask that you truly look at this in an objective way. I think you folks can because you're from out of town. And look at the situation and say, what in an ideal world would have been the best? The, the Smith College, uh, as I explained to you last night, uh, with a 20-year plan, they're going to obliterate that entire neighborhood. Yet right across the river, at abutting their um, athletic fields, there is the uh, hospital hill uh, that is available for that. Uh, we're gonna, the plan right now is to put a lot of housing there. The housing is gonna cost the city a ton of money. Um, as I explained last night, uh, for every dollar you get in real estate tax, it costs the, the city a dollar and 15 cents, and it's probably more than that. Uh, the other issue is the uh, hospital hill development. Uh, there is that old main building there that is truly a treasure, a historical treasure, and it's almost a criminal to, to tear that down. It is so unique, it's on the National Register, and I would ask you to look at that, again, in a very objective way, not, you know, leaving all the politics and all that kind of thing out of it. Um, my thought is that that hill would make an unbelievable campus if that uh, uh, building were restored. I mean. If you want to talk about hallowed halls, that would be one that would be fitting for that college. And the, the uh, commercial development on the south side of the campus would then truly be a, 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 a financial advantage for the city without the burden of those 200 and something homes that would be put there and the additional cost to the government, to the uh, city that would create. So, uh, Anyway, I, I really sincerely want to thank you all. I, I really totally enjoyed this whole experience. It was really, uh, you know, something for me. Thanks again. Sure. Well, thank you. Uh, just to follow up, since you did bring this up last night, we talked a little bit about it today. I don't know all the details, but I know that um, Smith College um, and uh, had some discussions about uh, using some of that land for their facilities. Um, and again, I don't know the details, but I understand there were some practical reasons why they they didn't feel was feasible. There may be some things that are, um, so that, that will be something to continue dialogue on. All right. We couldn't have done this without all of you being here, and we genuinely appreciate you taking the time um, to uh, articulate um, uh, uh, your points of view and, and your thoughts. Uh, they all have been, uh, as you noted, um, we have pages and pages of notes um, <laughs> that uh, uh, we'll add to uh, the cards that you turn in. And uh, we do look at all of them. We do, we do uh, try and uh, take every bit of it um, uh, seriously and, and look to uh, do the, the rigorous testing um, to make sure that you know things that are stated as facts are in fact facts. Tomorrow night will be at JFK High School, um, excuse me, JFK Middle School, um, to, uh, it's going to be a surprise to all of us, 
to present what we, uh, uh, what we digest and analyze and, and uh, look at to say, um, here's our assessment of what we've seen. And I can tell you, um, uh, it, we've been very impressed by what we've seen. Okay, you, you're uh, recognized as a leader in sustainability as a community in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of strengths to build on. We also know there's some challenges, and there's some, some things that, that are real issues that need to be worked out and grappled with. So there'll be a bit of a, an assessment part. There'll be a bit of a, uh, uh, a process that looks at what are the, um, what are the, what's the vision? Where would we like to be? You know, how do we know we've arrived? Someone said, you know, what's the vision? You know, how do we get there? Uh, and then the third piece will be, well, what are some of the recommended strategies to investigate, not to say that that's the answer, but to investigate as you go through the, the planning process of how to bridge the gap, what are some of the strategies that might be looked at to, to get to the sustainable future that we'd like to, to see. <coughs> so with that, I would thank you again for taking the time to be here um, and for keeping it uh, informative and uh, constructive. Um, turn in the cards and we hope to see you tomorrow night. Thank you.